basically let, put out a statement that said they're not running. He said, you know, we know where they are. They plan to show up for their arraignment, but they were concerned about the way that the prosecutor had handled it. They connected with her, trying to figure out, a, and, and I want you to talk about this, the fact that the defense, they contact the prosecutor. They want to work out the details of surrender, but instead of working those out and calling them back, they claim she went and did this public press conference. They're hiding out, afraid for their safety. All these things kind of make sense, but as a defense attorney, Talk about how they handled it. Was the right way, wrong way? Talk about that. Oh, sure. You know, especially in these high profile cases, and I've handled several of them, um, it's not uncommon for the defense attorney to be in communication with the prosecutor about the surrender of the client and to have that be arranged and have it not be this big media circus and, and have it be a relatively quiet affair. Um, what the defense attorney is saying here is that the prosecutor did the opposite. Prosecutor instead did this huge press conference where she's, you know, sort of taking this fire and brimstone approach and, and saying that everyone should be angry. Uh, and so from the defense attorney's perspective, you know, their clients were scared that they're sort of, you know, they don't want to uh, uh, encounter a mob with pitchforks on their way to the courthouse. Uh, and so I think that's really the argument the defense attorney is making for why his clients did not show up to this arraignment today. Yeah, because there's certainly an argument from a defense attorney's uh, perspective that the information put out by the prosecutor can put them in some danger. As we know, people were already calling for charges, which is why probably she responded the way she did. But she put a lot of information out there that I'd be worried if they were my clients. All right, let's talk about the charge in this case, involuntary manslaughter. Quickly, I'll just read through. When someone is killed due to someone else's criminal negligence, I think that's where it lies, their careless and reckless actions cause the death of a human being, and there seems to be a need for some sort of direct nexus. I'm not sure. I want to get your thoughts on the application of this crime, because when I look at it, basically the way she explained it, the fact that they uh, made the gun available in some way to their son, someone that they probably knew had some emotional issues, but also that day they were in the office, he had a backpack, and they didn't check that backpack for the gun, knowing that there were these notes that suggested he was having some issues and maybe some ideation of this kind of thing. Your thoughts on the application of that particular involuntary manslaughter charge and whether they can actually get the elements of that to actually convict these parents of it? Yeah, and voluntary manslaughter is defined differently in different jurisdictions. But but for me, there are essentially two pieces. First is was the uh, de were the defendants uh, criminally negligent? D did their actions fall severely below what we would expect a reasonable person to do under the same or similar circumstances? Here, I think absolutely, at least based on the information we have thus far. You know, there are these ominous indications that this child is troubled and 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 that he is uh, uh, prone to engage in some sort of violent behavior and harm others. And the parents knew about that. And they bought him a gun and treated it like it was funny and, and didn't really uh, take actions that we would expect responsible parents to take. Now, the second piece of involuntary manslaughter is, like you said, Michael, there has to be a, some causal relationship between the parents' actions and the ultimate outcome, which is these murders. Um, and so, you know, uh, but for the, the father buying Ethan Crumbly the firearm, would Ethan Crumbly have gone in and killed a bunch of people? Well, uh, perhaps not. And so that indicates there may be some causal relationship. But but on the other hand, you know, uh, parents can't control every single action of their child and, and the parents aren't around their kid 24-7. Uh, and so, you know, there's at least an argument that this kid acted on his own volition and, and these uh, acts and, and the consequences of those are his to bear and not the parents. That's at least an argument the defense will make. And, and that's the one that I'm, I'm focused on when I talk about this nexus and wondering uh, what the duty of care was and whether the actions of the son are almost an, an intervening cause that kind of insulates the parents on some level. I do know there's some federal uh, statutes, according uh, to what I've read and, and, and different information out there that we verified, um, when he bought the gun, um, essentially uh, he put down that it was going to be his gun. And, and under federal law, I think there's some serious um, implications there that with some pretty serious penalties that can fit this case very well. I'm just wondering if there's enough of a causal relationship to get this involuntary manslaughter charge. Yeah, you know, Michael, it seems like they've got the parents on some other stuff, right? I mean, like you said, you, you can't fraudulently misrepresent something on, um, you know, federal paperwork when purchasing a firearm. You can't do that. And that's a crime. Uh, and so I think that, uh, you know, they, they could potentially get James 
Crumbly the father on that crime. Um, but involuntary manslaughter is, is a bit of a reach, perhaps. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we haven't really seen other prosecutors go after parents in the same way in prior school shooting cases. And so will this case be a blueprint for future prosecutions of school massacres and going after the parents, um, only time will tell. Yeah, and you know, they, uh, she's also breaking new ground again in charges against uh, the young man as well. Uh, she's charging him with terrorism. Um, and I thought that was extremely interesting. And just quickly, um, it requires that there's a violent felony, Eric. It requires that a person uh, uh, does things, that an act that he knows is dangerous to human life. But the, the third one is the one that I think might cause a problem. It was an act intended to intimidate or coerce a civilian population or influence or affect the conduct of a government or unit of government through intimidation and coercion. And she wants to apply this to what happened here. Of course, the government unit being the public school, Oxford High. Your thoughts on applying that to this case as well to up the ante? You know, I get creative prosecutions in s severe cases. I, I understand well, that kind of approach. Um, but here, that final element is going to be tricky, I think. You know, uh, to suggest that this young man was doing this in order to uh, place the entire school community in, in fear and bring about some outcome for himself in response. Um, I, I'm just not sure that that is really congruent with the scope of, of a terrorism charge. You know, that, that those charges came about for uh, international terrorists. But in fairness, we, we've been dealing with a lot of domestic terrorism here in the United States as well. And so, uh, you know, I don't fault the prosecutor for trying to find creative ways to address the situations within her jurisdiction. Uh, but this one just may be a bit too far beyond the pale. And, and I'll, I'll be interested to see whether it sticks. I, I think it might not. Yeah, it all depends. You know, again, as you, as you well know, prosecutors don't give all the information out that they have. Maybe there are texts, maybe there are notes, notebooks uh, that they may have where he was actually writing things that he wanted the school to do or changes he wanted them to make, something that might underpin that third requirement that may make it more plausible. But right now, it looks like a little bit of a, a, a hill to climb there for the prosecution. All right, Eric, stand by. We're going to take a break now. Coming up, the jury was seated for the upcoming trial against former Minneapolis police officer. Officer Kim Potter. We hear from the attorney for the victim's family. He tells us how the family is doing during this trying, trying time. All right, keep it right here on Court TV, your front row seat to justice.